That's good. Okay, so today I want to talk about um, an approach to how discrete categories might arise within language <coughs> as a result of uh, the way neural hardware processes very frequently. And I'm going to start off though before I get into that by saying a few words about why I was quite interested to come to a conference about Ray um, in memory of Ray Solomon. And that was because when I was a young postgrad and I was beginning to work in machine learning of natural language structure, it was quite, uh, what's the word, a revelation to find Ray um, Solomon's paper in 1964 where he was actually showed that you could learn a number of the um, types of grammar that were beginning to be, at that stage, talked about in natural language. And this was in contrast to the dire statements from Chomsky and others about how language must be innate because it's just way too hard to learn it. It seemed like there wasn't such a computational barrier to learning anyway. So it has implications, that paper has implications in that indirect way for cognitive science as well as its direct application in computer studying and computer science. So on to the problem of discreteness that I'm going to address today, which is only sort of peripherally related to those original issues. The problem of discreteness is that <clears throat> while our environment that we live in is continuous, our language and the concepts that we express through it are largely categorical. That means they're chunked, they come in pieces. And what's more, our representations are arbitrary. So let's have a look at a nice, simple situation where we have a scale. In this case, the thermometer. And we have temperatures, words in English, down the right-hand side. We have cold and we have cool. You think, okay, cool sounds a little bit like cold, so that sounds a bit kind of topographic uh, in the sense I'll get to in a moment. But the next word in that series up is something like tepid, not very similar to either of them, and not in a very sensible way is it it's sort of halfway between cold and hot in terms of the form of the word. So to give you an idea of what language could be like but isn't, and it's the problem that I'm addressing, language could be like this. We could have the word hot for hot things, cold for cold things. And if you want to say, well, a little bit more hot than cold, we'd have cold. Okay. Go a bit further, up the temperature scale, you have cot. And so that's kind of one level of decategorizing language in the way it's currently structured in the lexicon. But you're still subscribing here to the phonemic categories of English. And why are they there? Why don't we just have a more continuous scale where we've got various sounds in between? So between cold and colt, you have something that's halfway between the D and the T as we normally have them in English, a sort of cold pronunciation. And between cot and hot, you would have hot. Or if you're you know, sufficiently flexible in your articulatory apparatus, you could have something like a, even between those top two, hot, using a sort of hip, as in tafria square. Uh, Arabic has more, more H sounds than we have normally in English. Uh, my point here is that, once again, there's an opportunity for continuity in the mapping between uh, what we're representing and how we express that in language that we don't use. Okay. Why is language never like this? And it's not just that English isn't like this. There's no language that's like this. Okay. Well, I'm going to take a small digression and talk about topographic mappings. Okay, so I'm going to go into uh, topographic mappings, then I'll present an outline of the argument, and then I'll go on to describe topographic mappings in the brain, because they're very common. So topographic mappings <coughs> take their name from the two Greek words you see, topos and graphia, because they're originally about how you represent place in writing. So this term has been used for travel writing, but nowadays with the mapping word after it, 
we tend to think of it as a way of representing geographical detail in, on paper in such a way that nearby bits of your geographical detail correspond to nearby bits of the paper in your representation. And that's the key point. Now the argument I'm going to make with these things is that topographic mappings as a kind of abstract functional concept are implemented widely in the brain. Okay? And what's more, we can actually get a formal handle as in a mathematical description of what it means to be topographic. And I'm going to use Goodhill's description of that particular property. Topographic learners are basically learning devices, abstract learning devices, that try and make the most topographic mapping that's possible given the constraints imposed on them. Those constraints might be your mapping has to include these particular preset values of outputs for particular inputs, but it may also be some constraints about how dense the outputs of the mapping have to be and so on. Now, <clears throat> we get to the main point, and that is if you take two spaces which are having uncorrelated uh, values popping up inside them, as in they're not correlated with each other, the two spaces, and you put a topographic mapping between them and say, do your best job in matching up whatever pops up in space A to whatever pops up in space B, then the resulting topographic mapping that a learner will come up with is one that's made up of contiguous categories, so categories that are not dislocated, made up of dissipated bits in the space, but chunks that are closed together in the space, connecting those to arbitrary outputs. And the conclusion I'm going to draw is that this gives us a model for how something like the lexicon could have arisen in humans as a, just a natural result of the wiring we have in our brain when that's connecting different parts of the brain that are related to as, uh, unreal, uncorrelated spaces like the concept space, and the space where you do your speech production. Now, I'm putting in a slide about what a prototypical topographic mapping looks like, just because I've had reviewers on um, in a follow-up work saying things like, you only have topographic mappings in a few places in the brain. And what they're talking about is a prototypical topographic mapping, one like the map of the Earth. Okay? These are generally smooth, small changes in the input result and small changes in the output same kind of geometry, two-dimensional surface coming in, two-dimensional surface coming in, going out, sorry. There's no structure changing involved in the mapping, and there's no arbitrariness other than perhaps orientation, and there's no categoricalness in the output. And this is, really, this is kind of interesting because actually you start to see violations even in the, the most prototypical of these mappings that occur in the brain. So, in the brain, Penfield and Rasmussen uh, gave a detailed description in 1950 of the relationship between sensors and motor functions on the extremity of the exterior of the human being <coughs> and how those are matched up with particular points on the relevant parts of the cortex, the sensory motor cortex. And these took the form of topographic mappings, which we'll see in a moment. Later on, people have found that this was in fact true when they doing, could do fMRI studies, and in fact have found that the detail in the topographic mapping was beyond what was found by Penfield and Rasmussen. <coughs> and more recently, people have found that there are many, many more such mappings in the brain. So this is what Penfield and Rasmussen found, is that you can actually lay out the structure of a human's surface around the cortex because nearby bits of your surface get the stimuli that are taken there, such as by touch sensations, are mapped onto nearby bits of the visual, sorry, the somatosensory cortex. And the same is true of the motor cortex. So the bits that wiggle your fingers on the same hand are near to each other in the cortex whereas your toes are wiggled by uh, neurons further away. Now, <coughs> Goodhill, in dealing with another problem, namely how mappings within the visual cortex work, 
developed a method of evaluating functions to how topographic they were, and my work is based on their evaluation function. And the idea is fairly sim simple. You have a similarity measure in your input space, similarity measure in your output space. If we're talking about a discrete mapping, you just take all the pairs of input output pairs that are in that mapping, and then you see, you take the product of the similarity of the inputs with the similarity of the outputs, and sum that for all the pairs. And the result is a measure which basically increases the more topographic the mapping is. So if similar inputs map the similar outputs, then you get a more topographic mapping according to this measure. <clears throat> and we can turn this into a learning method, as those of you who are involved in any kind of machine learning are familiar with, just by attaching it to a search mechanism to try and, if you've got some free variables in your mapping, trying and trying to instantiate those in such a way as to maximize that mapping. So you can do it in the form of unsupervised learning, and that's like saying, okay, I have no set outputs. The output is going to be free. The search algorithm should find the best output values for all the possible input values to make the mapping as topographic as possible. Or in supervised learning, you have some outputs specified for some inputs, and the rest you juggle to make fit. So we're going to consider those two cases. <coughs> a standard example of the unsupervised learning is the mapping from the retina to the cortex. So your images on your retina are coming upside down, back to front. Um, they get mapped onto the cortex, but this is a topographic mapping and that's an important thing. Particularly if you're a frog, it's a really simple process because frogs only look, don't have binocular vision. So they just, one eye looks over there, one eye looks over there. In the usual case for a frog. And so there's a fairly straightforward mapping from the retina on one side onto the corresponding part of the cortex. Nearby points on the retina map to nearby parts of the cortex. In humans, it's not nearly so simple because we have binocular vision, as do other apes and some other creatures. And what we find is ocular dominance stripes. And this is, I'm talking about this because it starts to get. Interesting, we start to get discontinuous behavior out of these topographic mappings. And what we have here is we have two ocular, um, maps of cortex from one side of the brain, the uh, visual cortex. The upper one is for humans, the lower one for macaques. And the dark lines you see there are where input has come into neurons in that part of the cortex from one eye and a white between the lines is where the input comes from the other eye. And so you can see that input from one eye with the other eye is interleaved really in a really fine way. And the reason for that is just to have correlated inputs being dealt with close together in the cortex. And Goodhill's explanation is roughly this, that actually if you lay things out in terms of how they get correlated, you'd actually have one layer of input from one eye, written from one eye, is really close in terms of its correlations to input from the other retina. And so the most topographic mapping, given that, actually will do this interleaving process. And he did simulations and showed that that's what you'd expect. And it's a very convincing explanation for these ocular dominance stripes. The question that might strike you then is, are these things built in? Do humans have ocular dominance stripes? Because over years of evolution, we have developed them and they're genetically specified. <clears throat> this isn't so useful if we're trying to use these as a basis for a model of language because we know language is pretty recent in our evolutionary history. Probably not too many genes are specifically talking about <coughs> language or talking about language to occur. Fortunately, we know that this type of structure isn't specified per species, but it happens in the individual. You may not be able to see very well, but this frog on the left has three eyes. Okay, one's pointing away from the camera, but there's two eyes on the one side. And this, is a, this isn't the actual frog in which this experiment's been done, but an experiment's been done to create frogs with two eyes on one side, one eye on the other side. 
And what you find is that when you check for oculodominant stripes, a frog, which you think has no real recent species history of having binocular vision, you find suddenly it's got these ocular dominant stripes. Oh. So in other words, you have this development because of the topographic mapping from the eyes onto the brain, it self-organizes into the most efficient way for processing that information. You know, that's what these mappings are good for. That's why they're there a lot in the brain. And it happens dynamically in the individual. Brains are plastic. If people lose their um, vision through one means or another, things get repurposed. The brain's pretty plastic. Since we're in Australia, it's worthwhile introducing another interesting creature into this discussion, and that's the platypus. On the bill of the platypus, there are mechanical sensors and there are electrical sensors, because as some of you may know, part of the way to detect possible food is by the electric fields that food gives off in living, small living creatures. What we find there is ocular dominance stripe equivalents that where information coming from mechanical sensations going through separate nerves is integrated with information from the electrico, electrosensor system. And so here we have, it's fairly faint, but the darker lines in this thing here are the inputs from the mechanical sensors, the, the touch sensors, and the white, whiter stripes or lighter stripes between them are the input from the electrical sensors. Okay, so we've looked at topographic mappings in the brain. <coughs> and as far as we know, these are largely ones that derive from unsupervised sorts of learning gas. And there's no preset endpoints or uh, you know, some of the neurons that have genetically defined pathways, we don't think so. We think the whole pathway might be specified, but not any individual outcome for any particular connection. But even so, we still are finding widespread, and here I must emphasize for this audience, TM doesn't mean Turing machine, but topographic mapping, in the brain. Okay? So if we're finding them, perhaps we can find them in supervised learning contexts as well. So what would they look like? What would it look like if we did supervised learning with these things? Well, basically they can learn a simple correlation pretty well. So here I gave a little simulator 20 points between 0 and 1, and the function applied to those points was y equals x, or you know, output equals input. And they were equally spaced. And I said extrapolate 1,000 points, and unsurprisingly, we get a mapping that's pretty good y equals x sort of mapping. Okay. Not a big surprise, it would be a pretty poor learner if we couldn't learn that one. But then I wondered what would happen if you give it 500 random input output points? I haven't put them on the slide here, but it's just imagine 500 points just scattered over that square, roughly evenly distributed, okay, subject to the vagaries of chance then the best extrapolation to a function that you get from a topographic learner is one in which you have a series of discrete, contiguous chunks. So you don't get a kind of crazy, random, uh, highly variable function. You get your data, your inputs, organized into chunks. So as we can see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven big ones couple of small ones. And these are a thousand points. So there's a chance for a thousand. I could have ended up with a thousand random points on that screen, but it doesn't work out that way. Okay, so the prediction here is that if you have a neural pathway that links cortical areas that are being fed by sensors that aren't necessarily having highly correlated inputs, so it's not like getting fed by two eyes, rather it's being like being fed by your ears and your eyes or something like that, then what we might expect to see is categorical relationships between them being formed. Okay. We expect arbitrary associations between the two spaces on a larger scale. Locally, where you have one chunk mapping up with one chunk, you might get some sort of topographic relationship developing, 
But if so, it's, chances are it'll be a fairly weak if it's present at all. And if you, I, I was looking around for what could possibly give me any positive encouragement on this front, and I came across synesthesia, and in particular, mm. uh, pitch color synesthesia. So we've got a continuous space of pitch, nice spectrum from low frequencies to high frequencies, and we have a color spectrum of, like a, we have an array of where you have colors blending into other colors. So there's an opportunity to see a continuous mapping if there's some connection between those two. But what De Thornley Head finds in his investigation of pitch color mapping, uh, sorry, pitch color synesthesia, is that first off, it's reliable. So it isn't just a metaphor or you know, a vagary of uh, imagination. It seems to be something that has a physiological basis, as at least it's got into long-term memory, and possibly something more basic than that. Secondly, what we get is a breaking down of pictures and colors into chunks, which are have no clear mechanism. There's no clear reason for breaking at the points in which those chunks are broken, and it varies from person to person. Also, these chunks are associated in an arbitrary fashion. So it's not like you know one color is regularly used to represent high pitches and another color regularly used to represent low pitches. It doesn't work like that. And any topographic relationship only happens within the categories, and that's if only head speaking, not myself there. And even then, it's not that often. It's pretty much what we were we were predicting for this kind of association. And people are suggesting in the literature that there is a neural basis for synesthesia. So this seems to be a case where it looks like this prediction in a simple model pans out when we look for it at the level of cognitive processing. Back to language, we find quite a few places where this could be applying in language. This could be part of the story of the origins of discrete categories in language. So in phonology, we have our continuous auditory perception. You know, there's no sudden jumps in your auditory perception between frequencies or uh, other aspects of that. And our articulatory motor uh, control, which is also fairly continuous in terms of the heights you can raise your tongue and how long you hold it at particular places, things like that. And yet we still end up with discrete phonological categories in every language. Different ones, but each language has its discrete set of phonemes. In syntax, we have similar kinds of discrete sets of possible arrangements of words. Uh, the important one for today's talk is the lexicon, where we have a conceptual, some kind of conceptual space being associated with a what I'm calling a speech space, which is both speech production and perception. And it seems that if these are linked by these kinds of extra topographic or topographic ones that are not prototypical topographic mappings, then we'd expect to get the kinds of effects we see. No global topographic structure and contiguous categorizations. Does the lexicon uh, actually show this sort of prototypical topographic structure? That's something we can actually check now that we have sufficient lexica online. And the study is actually being done. Uh, some people in Edinburgh, Richard Shilcock and the company, uh, did this for English, and Monica Tamarez has done it recently for Spanish. And the outcome is that you find topographic structure only in restricted domains. So in English, you get this sort of similar words having similar meaning, primarily in the area of exclamations or expletives, uh, which are generally fairly short, but similar ones have similar meaning. And in, for Spanish, I think, if I remember rightly, Monica Tamarez found that there was only a couple of phonological features that showed any topographic effect. Mostly what we find, so I'm just sort of mentioning the edges, but the bulk of the information in the lexicon 
shows arbitrary connection between fairly natural or contiguous categories. So it looks like these could possibly ex be explained by saying these are two spaces that have their own independent lives. You know, babies babble, as in produce and hear lots of speech that doesn't make any sense to them. And at the other extreme, there's lots of concepts that we entertain even when we're not speaking or not involving language. And we could explain this lexicon as the development of a pathway of a standard sort, the kind that's a pathway that's found throughout the brain in topographic mapping between parts of the cortex that are dealing with those two different spaces. And in fact, recent studies seem to suggest that there are pathways where damage only affects the lexicon, doesn't affect, for example, syntactic structure. So it seems that these things are separable into individual pathways. So wrapping up, what we have is smooth standard topographics mappings are well known. And we can generalize those to these sort of ones I call here extra topographic mappings, which are ones that are a little bit weird. You know, they're doing discontinuous stuff. Um, what I'm suggesting is that brains have these pathways that produce, will produce topographic mappings if they are running unsupervised, but exactly the same machinery between bits of the cortex that are having their own input coming in from separate sources will produce something more interesting, such as a categorical mapping. And that's what we find in synesthesia, and that's what we find in natural language lexica. <clears throat> and it seems that there is actually some candidates for the way this mapping might be in the brain. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. It's kind of like, is there some predetermined or preset in humans tendency towards associating some sounds with yeah. some particular shapes? Uh, there, are, are, there are attempts to explain that just by what shape you make with your mouth when you say different sounds. Or whether you're feeling like you're expanding your internal space or you're contracting it. And so I, I don't know whether those are sufficient to explain that. I, I think it's so marginal that I don't think it actually uh, relates to this. I'm not, I, I guess in terms of the context I want to talk about here, I don't think it's revolved in or the result of either, any of the kinds of mappings that we would see there. One last question. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this, this is uh, effectively phonetic symbolism called, uh, and I've heard people talk yeah. about it uh, in terms of more than just um, expletives uh, of, over a wider range. Do you, do you think there's anything to the notion that, and it's, it's mostly the first part of the word, that uh, what, where, why, and do you think there's anything about that that the, the structure of the word that kind of helps to decode. So you get the first part, and you say, "Oh, I'm gonna. I know it's. I know it's an expletive. So then I get a jump on decoding that." Uh, yeah. Yes. There's a couple of things to say. One is, it's some of the reasons why we have lots of question words beginning with wh they are historical. Okay, it has to do with the Proto-Indo-European had certain things that got compounded. In history. So other languages may not have that same correlation. Uh, in terms of um, 
does it help people when there certainly there is an effect of priming by the onset of words. Mm. And in fact, I was involved in a project in Edinburgh where we were looking at what's the information contour in English vocabulary, and later on other people did it for other languages, to see where the, whether there's actually more variation in the initial letters in words in English rather than the final letters. And in fact, we found there was. There is in fact a, a very steady drop off in the information value of per, you know, per letter information value of words uh, as you go from left to right. Them, and presumably a corresponding drop off in speech from the first word. And studies by, <coughs> I forgot my name, the psychologist at London who's spent quite a bit of time studying talking about cohorts <coughs> in terms of speech recognition, where the first bit of the word comes in, he's shown that people are already interpreting before they get the rest of the word, <coughs> already creating the, the set of possible completions. Yep. Thank you.